Thank you very much. Um, let me start off with Dr. Murthy. Uh, Senator Cassie and mentioned uh, what is true is that the Congress has taken some action. Uh, but I will tell you, as I go around Vermont and talk to teachers and principals, they tell me they need more help. Uh, in your judgment, do we have at this moment the kind of mental health infrastructure from psychiatrists, the social workers, the counselors that this country needs? Well, thank you, Senator. And, and I do appreciate the significant historic investments that have been made over the last few years. I think they have helped, but we do need more uh, to help build the infrastructure. When we think about care, for example, mental health care, there are several pieces of the infrastructure that still need to be expanded. Number one is mental health workforce itself. Uh, and I'm talking here not only about psychologists and, and psychiatrists and others in the traditional mental health delivery model, but I'm also thinking about peer support models and others which we know can help kids, and we need to think more broadly about that workforce. Right, let me ask you this. Yeah. Um, we've talked a lot about the problems. Talk about some of the solutions. Are there communities or schools in America that are doing something that is effective in addressing the crisis we're talking about? So that is the good news, is that there are successful models uh, around the country. Uh, many of them do not know about each other, and, uh, and hence are not learning from each other, and we have to invest in studying and scaling them. But a few that, that I'll mention, uh, one is the Becoming a Man program, uh, which has been a very powerful program, started in Chicago and now spread to some other cities, which has worked in high schools with per helping young people essentially be sources of support to one another and has been able to demonstrate uh, actual benefits uh, in trials that were run by the University of Chicago. We also know the After School Matters program has been another one which has brought community organizations together to be with kids and provide them mentorship support and safe spaces to play and learn after school. Uh, that has also demonstrated positive benefits. Let me ask you this, because you've written about this. Yeah. What is, you write about loneliness. Mm -hmm. And yet people spend half their lives on these things. Hmm. What is the difference, in your judgment, between human interactivity uh, and activity uh, on social media? And, and how does that impact the well-being uh, of, of Americans? Yeah, well, Senator, this has been a, an important point of concern for me. Uh, there is no substitute for in-person interaction. Uh, as human beings, we evolved over thousands of years to perceive not just the content of what someone says, but also interpret their body language to sense nonverbal cues. We take all of that in, uh, and that contributes to a rich human interaction. When you strip a lot of that away, uh, you lose uh, richness, you lose quality of connection. That's not to say there's never a place for texting or for online connection. But what I worry about is that the balance has shifted dramatically toward online connection and away from in-person connection, particularly for our kids. But the other concern, Senator, is not only what kids are missing out on as a result of social media, but what they're being exposed to on social media. And we, I, I talk to parents all over the country who, to, and, and to kids as well who say that they're exposed to content that's violent and sexual in nature, that they're often bullied and harassed online. Six out of 10 adolescent girls are telling us that they've been approached by strangers on social media in ways that have made them feel uncomfortable. So these are, I'm concerned both about what is not happening as a result of social media in our kids' lives, but also about some of the toxic effects of what they're being exposed to. Uh, Mrs. Nice, you spoke about the impact that Medicaid is having on providing services to kids who desperately need it. Uh, we are now, as a result of the end of the pandemic and the cessation of the funding, the many billions of dollars we put into funds and increasing Medicaid, what impact uh, will <coughs> hundreds of thousands or millions of people losing their Medicaid have on mental health in this country? Senator, thank you for that question. Uh, the work that we've done with the Department of Health and Human Services to make it easier for schools to access the Medicaid program for school-based services is one that we're, we're very proud of because we think it's going to make it easier for schools to hire and sustain necessary people. At the same time, we've been working hand in glove with the department to get word out to our school leaders about this time of, of re-enrollment and hoping that those children who um, have to re-enroll in Medicaid are found eligible. Um, 
and, and that those that are found not eligible can be directed to uh, another source of, of insurance. Um, but it is something that, that I think the, the administration is very concerned about and wanting to do everything we can to make sure that children who are eligible can stay on the program. But is it a concern that if hundreds of thousands of millions of families lose their Medicaid, it's going to make it harder for people to get the mental health services they need? Without question, sir. Senator Cassidy? Although I'm tempted not to because my fellow Southerner did not wear a 